Yo, yo, what's up everybody? Travis Peters here with The Increase Life. I wanna start off this video by letting you guys know I'm gonna be giving away $150 this week to one of my subscribers. All you need to do is be on my email list. There'll be a link in the description. You can get your free guide to Financial Increase 101. If you're not there already, I send out tips and strategies and biblical principles almost every single day on how to live a life of increase. So make sure you're on the email list. Uh, make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and just post a comment below. Maybe something that uh, you learned, something that stood out to you, something like that. If you do those things, we will check through it at the end of the week, and we will either PayPal you, Venmo you, Venmo you Cash App you, um, a lot of you guys follow me for my crypto passive income. We can send it in crypto. We'll do something like that, but we're going to be giving away $150 this week. We just want to be a blessing to you guys and say thank you for all the support and everything you helped us with over at the channel. So we love you guys. We want to sow that seed into your life. Now, today's episode is going to be crazy powerful. This might be the most important thing that you hear all year. This is my bread and butter teaching. This is the stuff I love to talk about, and I feel like it's part of my purpose on why God put me here on earth. But let's talk about why Christians get weird about money, riches, prosperity, and abundance. So if you hear those words, and riches make you feel weird, uh, prosperity makes you feel weird, you get that ugh kind of feeling on the inside, something is going on. And it's not okay. Here's why. All of those words, riches, prosperity, prosperous, abundant, abundance. These are all opulence. These are all scriptures and words that God has chosen to put in the Bible. So that means if those words make you feel weird... It is a man-made situation that has made you feel weird. It is not a godly situation because God used those words on purpose. This is the word of God. God's words that he selected matter. They were not flippant. There's a reason he used those words. There's a reason he says riches and wealth will be yours. All right? Wealth's another one I should have put on here. Wealth and wealthy. Now, I'm going to teach you something here that you've never heard before. Because it was recently uh, that I heard it put this way. It was about a different topic, but then I realized, wait, this applies here. That's what's happening here. This is why Christians get weird about money. Now listen, here's why this really matters, guys, is twofold. One, the more prosperous and wealthy and abundance of finances that you have, the more good you can do to help people. We were recently in a situation, there's two situations of uh, two friends of the family and both had something pretty tragic happen. Somebody close to them passed away in both scenarios. Well, my wife and I were able to bless them with an amount that was um, big enough that it was pretty impactful. Uh, they were stunned. I'll put it that way. But here's the thing. It what in the grand scheme of life, it wasn't that much. In fact, I wished, I hoped, and then I got in faith that next time something like this comes along, we can give double, triple, quadruple that amount. And, and that's just how we live. It basically sparked an increase, you know, faith movement in myself because I wanted to give more. I wanted to be more generous. And I know you watching this want to be more generous as well. So that's why we have to get this knocked out. But then two is when you have those weird feelings about those words. I remember talking to um, a buddy of mine and he was saying like, man, when I, when I talk about money, I use the word wealth because, you know, wealth just implies that you are you know doing well in every area of life when i use the word rich i just think of like dirty and greedy you know and the way he said it, the connotation he like did this with his fists and he was like you know rich oh that's something he made up you got that from movies you've watched you've heard me talk about this there was an article written in forbes magazine about how 
Every every villain since the 1960s in Hollywood has been portrayed as a, a wealthy, horrible person, but they're always wealthy. Even romantic comedies. Last Christmas season, I watched a ton of Hallmark movies with my wife. And the bad guys in that were always these greedy, corporate, wealthy business owners. And rom-coms. This is just the enemy's tactic of trying to get you to think that these are bad things or that you will become bad if you get them. The Bible does not say that. We're going to talk about a couple scriptures you might think say that, but then when you go read them, you're like, oh, it doesn't say that. My parents were wrong. My grandparents were wrong. My you know, preacher I listened to as a kid, he was wrong. The guy I listened to on TV, he was wrong. The Bible does not say that. So here's why we got to fix this, is because if we don't, we will short circuit when it comes to money. And I like that phrase, short circuit, because it's, I, I see it over and over, guys, please hear my heart. I see it over and over. I have lots of conversations about money with Christians. And it's kind of the same thing, the same pattern over and over and over again. You have this thing in your mind where if I make this much money or get this much money, it's cool, it's okay. But anything above that, I don't need more than that. Now I'm weird. Now I'm selfish. Maybe I'm greedy. Maybe I'm just thinking of my own and not helping other people. I'm taking from someone else to increase. Me increasing means somebody's decreasing. Me having an abundance means someone else has scarcity and lack. No, 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 no. Even in the natural, that isn't true. It's not true in the spiritual. It's not true in the natural. Last I checked, the U.S. Treasury was printing $500 million a day. You can't even run out of money in the natural, but you definitely can't run out of money in the spiritual if you believe God's principles. Oh man, I just realized I could I could probably talk on this. This could be a two-hour video. Maybe it needs to be. It's not going to, but maybe it needs to be. Maybe there'll be there'll be more to this. But listen, we short circuit because what I see over and over again is a Christian who wants increase, but then hits a a limit, a lid that they've put on themselves. Uh, First Corinthians 6 or 16, one of those, talks about how, look, you're limited by the own limits you put on yourself. God did not limit you. God put no lids on you, no limits on you. One translation says God, didn't fin- God did not fence you in. The smallness you feel is because of lids you put on yourself. And that's what I keep seeing. So it's like, We've got this value threshold or this moral threshold that if I make this much money, it's fine. If I make more than that, ugh, I don't want to be that guy. So here's the problem. And this is the unique perspective I've never heard about or thought about before. Again, I heard it in another context, but I brought it over here because it applies. Here's what Christians are afraid of when it comes to money. They are afraid of losing, but, or and, you're also afraid of winning. Let me explain. This is what causes people to short circuit. It's what causes them to stop, to break. When I think of, when I say short circuit, you could also picture self-sabotage. And Christians do it in their money and their success all the time. And the devil loves it. He smiles with his cohorts and his friends when he watches you put a limit on your life. And he says, ah, I have won. He knows he can't talk you out of your Christianity out of your salvation, but man, if he can put a lid or a limit on the good you can do, he's great with that too. All right. So what are you afraid of losing? All right. So we're afraid of losing. You've had thoughts like this. I don't want to lose money or I'll be a bad steward. My first challenge to you is go find all the scriptures that talk about being a good or bad steward. 
that word is actually not in the Bible much at all. And when you find it in context, you will realize that doesn't mean what I thought it meant. See, you're afraid of losing money. I've got an, um, a membership program where we teach investing and we do a lot of things that create passive income. We do a lot of it in the cryptocurrency world and some different things. And uh, I get this question all the time. Like, what if I'm a bad steward? What if one of the investments doesn't work out? I lose money. And then they stop there because it's like, wait, what do you think is going to happen? Well, if I lose money, then I'll be a bad steward. One, what scripture says that? Two, if you lose money, do you think God is going to get mad at you? What scripture is that? And then, and then he'll say like, because you lost my money, I will never give you more. And now you're stuck in a bad spot and you're going to have to figure things out on your own. What? What scripture is that? See, we have all these thoughts about, you haven't challenged any of these thoughts. You just accepted whatever came your way. All you got to do, guys, is just look it up. Subscribe to this channel. Go back through to... I mean, you can see through the titles of my, my videos or my podcast, however you want to listen to. It's on iTunes, it's on Stitcher if you prefer listening. But go through those and, and find out what God actually said about being a good steward. Money, increase, abundance, riches, and wealth. I'll give you the actual scriptures and then you make a decision on what you want to believe. I'm just saying, don't let your old thoughts on how you, the way you thought growing up and stuff people fed you back then, don't let that dictate or determine your own beliefs. Make your own beliefs. I'm trying to get you to just make your own beliefs based off the scripture. Not what your grandpa told you. See, we hear things all the time that sound good, but they're not scriptural per se. You hear, you hear scriptures about, or not scriptures, you hear people talk about, you know, why you shouldn't have this much money and having too much money is a sin. Well, if the right person says that, somebody you've given authority to in their life, let's say um, the, the, the pastor you had when you were a kid and growing up used to preach about how um, I don't want to have too much money because, you know, then I could become a sinner and I could squander it and I'd be wasteful and I could do all these things and greedy and selfish and sin and however they worded it. And you heard that and they, they said it with confidence. They said it with certainty. They had a place of authority in your life. And you were like, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I don't ever want to get that rich because that would just be wasteful. Like, what would I do with all that extra money anyway? I'd probably just do something stupid. I'd probably just end up sinning or something. <laughs> and you carried that with you. That little seed was planted and you carried it with you into adulthood. And you're wondering why you can't get ahead financially. Why is it such a struggle? Why is it every time I get a little bit of margin, a little bit of extra, something breaks, something happens, something goes awry, and I lose my increase? It's because your belief system has been programmed incorrectly. Your moral compass is telling you, alert, 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 you're about to get ahead financially. That means you're going to become greedy, sinful, selfish, and a horrible person. Back up, back up, back up. This is how it works. This is the soil of your heart. Mark 4, where it talks about the different soils, the hard heart, the stony heart, the thorny heart, and then the good soil that is open to receive. I really, really hope you're connecting the dots here. So let's go back over here. Losing. Obviously, I don't want to go broke. I don't want to go bankrupt. I don't want to lose money. Right? You're afraid to take risks because what if it doesn't work out? What if I go broke? What if I lose it all? Right? Which means you're not taking into Philippians 4.19 into consideration 2 Corinthians uh, 9 through 6 or 2 Corinthians 8 through 9. You're not taking into consideration Galatians 6, 7, 8, 9, Philippians 4.17 as well. Uh, Philippians 4, 6, 7, and 8. Like all these scriptures, Matthew 6.33, Proverbs 3, 9, and 10, all the ones that talk about... <laughs> You know, I can spit these off because these are all ones that I've built my faith around. God will meet your needs. 
Okay, but why are we afraid of winning? All right, and, and here's what really opened my eyes because we're afraid of losing and we're afraid of winning. And this is why people short circuit is because you get stuck right in the middle and you don't really lose, but you don't really do that great either. So welcome to the average middle-class life of mediocrity. And that's why the Christian life is not very attractive to outsiders because you're not really doing anything great. You're kind of just right in the middle and just people look at your life and you're like, oh, cool. You're doing okay, I guess. You go Google average uh, medium income for United States or wherever you live. You're making about what it says. You got your job, you get to live 401k. And it's like, yay. <laughs> so I, I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant at the end of my life. I do not want to hear, well, you're done. Come on in. All right, you survived. I don't want to hear that. I want to hear well done, good and faithful servant. And that comes with a life of obedience. And what also comes with a life of obedience is a life of winning. But here's why you cannot be afraid of winning. You just trap not afraid of winning. I remember people used to talk about the fear of success. And I was like, no one's afraid of success. I'm not afraid of success. But my eyes needed to be opened to what that really meant. So here's why you're afraid of winning. New responsibilities. Winning comes with new responsibilities. And when we win, and when we think about those new responsibilities, we think, oh, I don't know if I could handle that. I might mess that up. I'll probably mess that up. I don't have a college degree. I could never do that. I don't know anything about that topic. I'm not that guy. I'm not that girl. And so again, you short circuit and you back down, you self-sabotage from winning because you are afraid of the new responsibilities that come with winning. Let me give you some examples. About 12 years ago, I started mentoring a couple guys at my house. They'd come over on Saturday mornings and they wanted to learn how to create an online business. I had successfully done one. I was at least making a, I was making a couple thousand bucks, two, three grand on the side. Back in the day, like I said, 12 something years ago. And so they were coming over and I was teaching them what I was doing and I was helping them. It was super fun. I enjoyed it. I remember my wife would cook breakfast and uh, it's just a great time. Before I had kids, it was awesome. Well, one of the guys, uh, he would start saying, man, I just don't know what to do about taxes. Now, this is a guy who did not have a business idea yet. He was kind of playing with some. He hadn't, he hadn't cited on one. No website. No offer, no email list, no ads, no traffic, literally nothing but just a thought of it would be cool to have my own business. That's all he had. And here he is worried about taxes. 10, 11 years later, I ran into the guy. I'm talking a decade later, guys. And I said, hey, did you ever start an online business? And he goes, nah, I never did just because, man, I'm just so worried about like taxes. What? You, the devil got you to not start for over a decade because you were worried about a problem you don't even have yet? Let's make a dollar first and then maybe we could think about taxes. And just anybody watching this who's had this same fear and thought, taxes are easy, guys. Just keep your receipts, put them in a shoebox, and then at the end of the year, you give them to your tax person. Another easy way is to just, at the end of the year, you go to your online uh, bank account, you sort it by expenses, it's usually one or two clicks. You line it out for last year, and you hit print and then you bring it to your tax person and you say, I used these expenses on my business and here's the money I made. You could be done in eight minutes. 
It's not hard. Uh, another thing you can do is, here's what I do. I take a portion of all the money that comes in and I put it in a different bank account called taxes. And then every single year, I save up more than I actually need and I get a nice little bonus money at the end of the year. Done. But the devil got him to stop for over a decade. And to my knowledge, he never started anything because of the fear of new responsibilities. What about taxes? I met another guy who said the same thing. He said, I'm not an entrepreneur. I would probably just mess something up and end up owing the IRS a million dollars. That ridiculous thought actually stopped him. It's really, listen, it is a stupid thought. It's really dumb. It's ridiculous. The enemy should not be able to trick or deceive us that easily. That is a very easy, low-level deception. He didn't even have to try. I mean, let's at least make it hard for the devil. We're making it so easy for him. I mean, think about it. I'd probably, I'm no good at entrepreneur stuff, which one, who said, two, who is good at the stuff. None of us are just, we all just learned and read books and figured it out. Like, I don't know what y'all think entrepreneurship is. You must think it's some kind of mystical, magical thing. Is not. You just think different. And to, in order to think different, you just read this book and you realize everybody in here was an entrepreneur. Anyway, that's another story. It's another lesson. But, but listen to this. In order for you to mess up and owe the IRS a million dollars, you probably would have had to make between seven and $10 million in your business. If you make seven to $10 million in your business, you will gladly give a million dollars in taxes. Hey, thank you. I'm thrilled. I made $8 million this year. Yeah, I'll give a million dollars in taxes. Cool. I got seven left over. It was a great year. But do you see what I'm saying? New responsibilities. This is causing people to short circuit. Uh, here's another one. Well, if if I do, uh, I talked to someone else who was trying to start an online business and uh, the thing they made was out of wood. It was like a woodworking craft that they were wanting to sell. So I was like, okay, cool. Let's just get this thing started. Let's throw it up on Etsy. Let's throw it up on a couple other websites and let's just get some bites. Let's just see if we can get this thing rolling and uh, see if people are interested. Well, I'm not, here's the response. I'm not quite ready yet. Let me go make some more. I want to make at least 50 of these. That way, um, if we do get all these big orders, then they'll be ready to sell and we'll, we'll be able to handle it. I said, no, 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 no. We don't even know if you can sell one. Let's go make one and sell one. Then you can, you can take it off of Etsy for a minute and then we can go make some more if you want. But let's just see if we can sell one. Well, they couldn't handle that. That, for whatever reason, caused them to, no, no, that wouldn't be right. Can't do it that way. And so they got to go make 50 of them, which took forever. In fact, it's such a big daunting task that they never got it done and never got anything launched. They were afraid of new responsibilities. What if I get all these orders? This is what it looks like to be afraid of success, afraid of winning. Uh, you do it in relationships. Uh, you know why people self-sabotage once they get to a certain, they're dating and maybe they've, they've been there in the past. They dated a guy or a girl. Um, we'll just talk from my side. It'd be like dating a girl for two years and you're thinking about proposing, but you remember that the last girl you dated for two years, when you proposed or right when you were about to, things got crazy, things got weird, things got painful and y'all broke it off. Well, now you're afraid, what if I'm not going to be a good fiance or a good husband? You know, maybe you come from a family where there's a lot of divorce and maybe your dad was not a good husband. Or maybe I know people who are afraid to have kids because they're afraid they're going to be bad parents because they had bad parents and they had bad grandparents. And so it's all they know is how to be a bad parent. And they saw the pain and trauma that that went through in the upper generations. And now they're afraid that they're going to screw their kid up. 
I see that all the time in the secular world. I'm just so afraid I'm going to mess my kid up because, man, I read the study and by age three, their personalities are hardened and developed. And by age seven, if this isn't fixed, then they're basically on a road to destruction. And what if I can't help them get there? And what if I do this? And what if I mess them up? What if I jack them up? What if it's all my fault? And I create these horrible kids who lose. What if I'm a horrible spouse and I mess it up? What if I, what if I, what if I, what if I? You're afraid of the new responsibilities that come with winning. And here's the big Christian one. What if I get rich and I become a greedy, awful sinner? Well, I've got good news for you. Money doesn't actually change people. It doesn't change you. Money just magnifies and amplifies what and who you already are. That's good news because you're a generous person. All you want to do is bless people. You dream about new levels of generosity. Well, guess what? When you win financially, you can walk those out. This is just the enemy's strategy and tactic to get you afraid, to get you in fear, so that you do not move to the winning side. If we can break this, you guys can become wealthy and generous and prosperous. Don't you want to do things like pay off your parents' house? Don't you want to be the one who goes and can fund an orphanage? Don't you want to be the one who can send the missionary instead of giving 50 bucks? Man, give them 50 grand. Instead of giving somebody, oh, I'm going to bless you, I'm going to put $100 in the offering plate. Why don't you give $100,000 to your church this year? but you can't be afraid of winning. The devil wants you afraid of losing and he wants you afraid of winning. He wants you afraid because when you are afraid, you are not in faith. You are in the natural. It takes all the supernatural out of your life and puts everything in your own hands on your shoulders. You got to carry the burden and the weight of losing and then you got to carry the burden and the weight of winning. Let me ask you something simple. Let's say... You do start winning. You do start becoming successful. Do you think you could ask God for help on what to do with your taxes? Another one people are afraid of is, man, if I do well, I'm going to have to get new employees. I've never hired anyone before. What if I mess it up? Or what if you just crush it? Do you think God could teach you how to manage a flock? How to shepherd some people? James 1.5 says, I can ask God for wisdom in anything that I need wisdom on. And he'll give it to me. Do you think he could, you could ask him on how to invest and get some wisdom there? Wisdom on taxes, wisdom on employees, wisdom on opening new locations, wisdom on going up the corporate ladder? I've heard this story a couple of times. Um, I, I knew a guy who he finally... And he's uh, from an immigrant descent. And so he already felt like there's a lot of challenges ahead of him. He already felt like things are tougher for him. Um, You know, some immigration stuff, legal stuff, things like that. And, uh, you know, great guy, loves the Lord, Christian. And he was telling me the story. And he he texted me. He actually got uh, the promotion he'd been wanting. He got the promotion. He actually was made a manager over a whole crew and a whole division. And I'm celebrating with the guy. Came with a big promotion, like a big financial raise, making good money, worked his way up. Tells me about six weeks, maybe eight weeks later. Oh, yeah. I was like, how's it going, man? Checked in on him. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Man, I actually went to my boss and I told him I want to go back down to just being a worker. Like, and being... You know, being the manager, being the supervisor, it was just so much pressure. It was just, I didn't want that kind of pressure. Um, I went ahead and took the pay cut. I didn't think it was worth it. Uh, That pay increase was not worth the pressure that I had to be under. So I just went ahead and went back to what I was doing. (sighs) Feels like the devil's not even trying. It feels so easy. (laughs) 
Instead of expanding our capacity, asking God for wisdom and saying, God, make me tough. Remember Paul said, harden yourself to difficulty? Well, we got to do that if we want to win. He was afraid of the new responsibilities. Too much pressure. Remember Paul? He even said, although I am pressed from every side, I receive no pressure in my heart. There's scriptures that answer everything. There's biblical perspective and God's promise for everything. God, help me, help me to live like Paul. Yeah, I might be pressed from every side. It looks tough. It looks crazy, but I will receive no pressure in my heart. John 14, 26, Jesus said, do not let your heart be troubled. Do not let it be afraid. Well, my friend was letting his heart be troubled. He was letting it become afraid. He wasn't doing Matthew 6, 33. He wasn't doing James 1, 5. God made all this provision to help him, but he chose to retreat. Uh, Hebrews 10 talks about, don't shrink back. My soul takes no pleasure in that. He shrunk back. Afraid of losing, but you're also afraid of winning. So here's what I want you to do. And I, I could go on with more examples. I've got a ton in my head right now. We specifically are talking about money. Let me do one thing. A lot of you guys are thinking, you're trying to think of scriptures right now that back up uh, the way, the, 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 the one that's struggling, like grinding against you the most is where I talk about certain levels of wealth and you have this threshold where now all of a sudden if you get this much, it's fine. But if I go above that, then it's just greedy. Then it's just crazy. I remember I was talking to a guy and he goes, he was sitting around the table and uh, he said, oh man, I wish I was, you know, this guy at my company, uh, you know, he's been there longer than everybody. And man, I wish I was making the kind of money he makes. He's making ungodly money. And so I'm like, this is a Christian. This conversation actually happened at church. And I was like, what the... Uh, Interesting use of verbiage there. What do you mean by ungodly amounts? And the guy goes, $80,000 a year. And I was like, this is like a full grown man too. Like, it's not like a teenager. Like, dude in his 30s, right? And uh, I'm like, I didn't mean to, but I was like, Poof, when he said 80000 a year. Like, it just came out of me. Shouldn't have done it. Should have controlled myself. But it just came out. And he was like, what? I was like, that's ungodly to you. One, let's not use that phrasing. That doesn't make sense. And then two, God, I've made 80 grand in a month. Many, 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 many times. And they looked at me like, you have, what? You have? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you guys are thinking too small. 80 grand a year, that's nothing. Let's get above that. The world is thrilled with that. But we're God's chosen people. We can go higher than what the world goes. What they make in a year, let's just make it in a month. And it's just blowing their minds, right? But I'm trying to get you guys to think about winning. Because when you're making 80 grand a month and more, and on the regular, do you know how much good you can do? You're going to pay off all your debts super quick. And then you're going to pay off your parents' debts. And then you can pay off your friends' debts. And then you can pay, pay off your church's debts. And you're going to get everybody free so they can all focus on what God called them to do. You're going to help so many people. It's just going to amplify the generosity you have already. So let's go to 1 Timothy. So when I, um, if I was to ask you, you know, what scripture says that money is the root of all evil, one, you couldn't tell me. And two, it's actually 1 Timothy 6.10. And it says the love of money or the preference and priority of money. And if you look up the, the original translation, like the original Greek, it says, the insatiable greed for money. That's great. You don't have any of those things. You're off the hook. So it says this. For the love of money, this is what it actually says. Can you please just listen? This is the uh, Amplified Classic. So I like this because it goes in and it dives into the original uh, Greek meanings, Hebrew meanings of the words, so that you know the translation is accurate. For the love of money is a root of all evils it is through this craving you don't crave money you want it that's fine but you're not craving it 
You don't have an insatiable greed for it. You're fine, okay? It is through this craving that some, it does not use the word all, that some have been led astray and wandered from the faith and then pierced themselves through with many mental pangs. That's what the actual scripture says. That's the one you've been afraid of. That's the one that has made you afraid of winning. And you didn't even know what it said. You didn't even know where it was in the Bible. See, you've been reading it or you're think not even reading it. You're thinking about it like an absolute. If I, here's what you're thinking. If I get rich equals I will wander from the faith. Well, that's actually even putting it lightly. What you're really saying is if I get rich, I will become evil. That's what you're really thinking. That is what you have associated rich with. But the Bible doesn't say that. I just read you the scripture in 1 Timothy 6.10. I can read it again if you want. It says the love of money is a root. It's not going to say the root. It just says a root of evils. It is through this craving that some, so you've read it as all, that money will, that money will make me crave and it will make me wonder from the faith. It makes everybody. It doesn't say that. Please just challenge these thoughts you've had. Please just go look them up for yourself. It's so clear. Don't let the devil trick you. You're letting the devil trick you because you don't have knowledge. Just go get the knowledge. I've done most of it for you if you just go back through my YouTube videos or podcasts. If you just join any of my courses, I lay all of this stuff out in detail for you. All right, now listen. The well, here, here's what we need to do. If we go over to, and I'm wrapping up here shortly, don't worry. If you go over to Proverbs 10, verse 22, it says this The blessing of the Lord, it makes truly rich. The blessing. makes one rich and listen to this he adds no sorrow to it go look it up for yourself go get you a concordance go to blueletterbible.com or .org and look up the word rich most of the times it's the word puteo and it literally talks about a physical abundance of material things. It talks about literal money, wealth, riches, and gold. This is not spiritual riches. This is one point. The blessing makes one rich. So rich can't be bad because the blessing of God makes one rich. And he adds no sorrow to it. If you become greedy, selfish, evil, wander from the faith, do horrible things, that means there's sorrow with it. You guys, this is easy. This is easy. Stop short-circuiting. Stop being afraid of winning. God wants you to win, even in the area of money. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just write these down, and this will kind of, if, if you want to learn more about this, you can go look it up. If you don't, you can keep living with your thousand dollars in your savings account, and you can just stay there for the rest of your life. Second Corinthians eight nine. My personal favorite, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 12. Traff's favorite. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. All these talk about having abundance. I want to read you something in 2 Corinthians 8, 9. This first one right here. Because this one will blow your mind if you believe it. This is where you got you to gotta decide... What do I actually believe? And you can do all the studying you want to help you. But if you don't do the study, that's on you. I'm also going to tell you about 
Deuteronomy 8. We're not going to go through all these here. We'll probably hit this one, though. And then you can read all in Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14. And it's all these scriptures about God increasing you, blessing you, making you rich, making you wealthy. I mean, it's the whole Abrahamic covenant. Genesis 12, uh, Genesis 13, Genesis 15, Genesis 17, and I think 19 all talk about the Abrahamic covenant where God promised to make you, your name, and your descendants famous, influential, and wealthy. And then Galatians 3.29 says, if you are a Christian, everything I promised Abraham is now yours. Please just read this stuff. It's going to change your life. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 8.9. For you becoming progressively acquainted with and recognizing more strongly and clearly the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. His kindness, his gracious generosity, his undeserved favor and spiritual blessings. In that so... He was so very rich. Listen to these words. These are words that God used. He was so very rich. Yet, for your sake, he became so very poor in order that by his poverty, you might become enriched and abundantly supplied. So in the same way that Jesus took on the curse, when he went to the cross, he took away the curse. A lot of the curse is summed up in Deuteronomy 28, 15 through 56. And it talks about poverty. It talks about sickness. It talks about premature death. It talks about all the horrible things that come with living in the world's kingdom. The curses. Here is where it talks about Though he was so very rich, now again, if you don't think that that means physical money, you might say, oh, Trav, that's spiritual riches. A lot of you guys have the shield of, every time you hear the word rich in the Bible, you think it means spiritual riches. Well, the only reason you think you mean you think it means that is because you haven't looked it up yourself and studied it. You just come with this filter that money is evil, even though I just showed you the scriptures that do not say that, and you got to go look this up for yourself. Again, go to Blue Letter Bible. Use the concordance feature, type in this scripture, and then you click the word rich, and it will tell you what the word rich really means. Also, we know that it is important to read the Bible in context. So, all of 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, the next chapter, is literally talking about a physical money offering that they are taking up as a church and they're going to give it. So, right in the middle of talking about money, actual literal money, it says that Jesus was rich and for your sake became very poor so that through his poverty, you might become enriched and abundantly supplied. So if you think they're going to talk about literal money, literal money, oh, spiritual riches, literal money, literal money, literal money, turn the next page, literal money, literal money, literal money, then you're weird. Okay. You just don't want to win if that's how you're thinking. All right. Um, let's go one more. Let's go one more. I could go a ton more. Let's go one more. We'll go to Deuteronomy 8. If you read Deuteronomy 7, it talks about a lot of financial blessings. But Deuteronomy 8, even go back to verse 13, it talks about when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied. And it goes down and it keeps saying all these other things are going to multiply. And it says, look, just beware that you say in your mind and your heart that my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. Don't say that. But you shall earnestly remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Now, again, I think it would be foolish to think that the scriptures that say your silver and gold will be multiplied. And then you think the word wealth down there means some kind of spiritual wealth? No. You're just saying don't be prideful. Just give God the glory. Give God the credit. That's all you got to do. You're afraid of losing and you're afraid of winning. All you need to do is study. Uh, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 1 Peter, I believe. It says grace, peace, and prosperity will be multiplied to you 
as you grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So all you got to do is grow in the knowledge of this. Your grace, peace, and prosperity will be multiplied to you. Well, you're struggling because you never studied this. Look, I pulled up all these scriptures. I did not have to go look them up before this video. I just hit record on this video. I know all of these things because I've planted them in my heart. I've studied them. I put, I put some time in. I put some effort into this. I'm just asking you to do the same if you want to win. If you do not do this, you don't have to do this. You don't have to look these things up. I've got resources that make it easy. Like I said, I got tons of videos. I've got courses that outline step-by-step -step how to do all this, put it all together and activate it in your life. You don't have to do any of it. But you can also just go about your life living average, short-circuiting between, I'm not doing that bad. I'm doing okay. But you're also not doing great. Ain't nobody talking about you. Ain't nobody looking at your house and being like, whoa, let's talk, buddy. What do you do? You don't have the influence. You don't have the... I mean, really, that's it. You need to... You need people to look at you and be like, that guy's life's different. That girl's life is different. Tons of scriptures. Think about Malachi 3.12, where it talks about people should look at your land and call it a delight. They should look at your life and call it a delight. It should take, people should take notice of how you're living. Then you have an opportunity to talk to them about Jesus. I've got stories and stories about how you, you go through, back, through my stuff. And um, man, I've gotten door-to-door -door salesmen saved on my front porch because they look at my house and they're like, how do you afford a house like this? And I said, have you ever heard about tithing? And they're like, what's that? Told them about tithing. Then I led them to the Lord. Things like this happen because I'm not afraid of winning. And if it, sometimes I might hit something where I, I catch myself and I'm like, I am afraid of winning here because I'm thinking, man, if I win, I might have new expenses, a new employee I got to manage, a new whatever. And then I stop and I catch myself and I'm like, no, God will give me wisdom. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich and he adds no sorrow with it. So if there's sorrow trying to come on, that means it's not from God. If there's a spirit of fear, that's from the devil, never from God. Because in 1 Timothy, it says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So if there's fear coming, nope, that's not God. That's the enemy. I don't receive it. And I go back to the scriptures and I study this thing. Don't be afraid of losing and winning. Don't be afraid of anything. It's the spirit of fear operating. You got this. God will give you wisdom. God will see it through. Psalms 32, 8 talks about how God will lead and guide you down the best pathway for your life. He's got you. He'll never leave you, nor forsake you, nor abandon you. Matthew 6, 33 just says, seek the kingdom of God first and all these things will be added unto you. Just go to him first. Ask him first. Inquire of him. Get your strategy. I like uh, David and uh, also the stories of when Abraham did this, David did this, Solomon did this. Uh, when they were taking over the promised land, the leaders did this, is they would go inquire of the Lord and say, I've got a battle. God, what's my strategy? And God would give them a strategy on how to win every battle. He'll do the same for you. Don't get weird around money, riches, prosperity, wealth, abundance, and increase. Those words are from God. Those words are godly. Those words are made for Christians. Those words are made to describe you. If you've got a weird connotation around them, that's man-made. That's not God-made. Eliminate it. Cut it out. Get rid of it. And replace it with what God said. See, that's the only way to actually do this, guys. You cannot just eliminate old thoughts. You have to replace them with new ones. You can't eliminate old programming. You have to replace it with new programming. Simple way to do that? Study these scriptures. Here's another simple exercise. I'll wrap up with this. Here's how the devil usually works. He gets you to ask yourself, what if it doesn't work? So here's all you're gonna do. Every single time, a thousand times a day, take out a note card, write it on a note card, and put it in front of your computer, wherever you see it, in your dashboard, on your background of your phone, type it up, put it on your phone, whatever you gotta do. And every time this thought comes, because it come, it'll come at you it looks 700 times a day, okay? Every time you get that thought, you are going to replace it with, but what if it does work? And you're going to let your mind dwell on that. See, your mind's going to take a rabbit trail down either path. What if it doesn't work? And then you're going to think about all these bad things, domino effect of what if it doesn't work. But now you're going to stop that, 
shut it down. 2 Corinthians 10 says, take every thought captive. So we're going to take every thought captive and we're going to flip it and say, but what if it does work? And then we're going to let the domino effect of what if it does work? What if I do pay off my bills? What if I can't employ people? What if I can build a business? What if I can start the ministry? What if I can help hundreds of thousands of people? What if I can raise millions of dollars? What if I can do this? What if I can? What if it does? What if it does? What if it does? That's how you're going to reprogram yourself. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich and he adds no sorrow to it. There's no sorrow to getting rich if you just put God first, which you already do. This is easy. I love you guys. Again, we're giving away 150 bucks. Descri links in the description. Go to the description of this video or this podcast, and I want you to see of all the other resources I have to help you with this. Most of them are free. Some of them are paid. For those who want to go further faster, you want to accelerate your results in this, you can do that. None of them are expensive, and they're all crazy powerful. They're all rooted in God's word. I love you guys. I'll see you in the next one.